I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Claudia Heibau, the chaplain of the Divinity School, who is going to introduce our moderator for this afternoon's panel, the first of this afternoon's panel, first of two. Um, so if we could, again, quickly check our seats, and uh, Claudia Heibau will take the mic and introduce our moderator for this afternoon's panel. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Townsend Jilks, who is written about here in your program. She is John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur, Professor of Sociology and African American Studies at Colby College. Um, there is printed for you in the uh, program um, something about uh, the Reverend Dr. Jilks. I also wanted to uh, bring to your attention her recent work, um, a text that she is working on, that blessed book, The Bible in the African American Cultural Inauguration. And, uh, I'm sorry? The, the Bible, I knew that. The Bible in the African American Cultural Imagination. And she's also um, working on an introduction to uh, Du Bois, uh, The Gift of Black Folk. She also provided an afterword to Charles Limmer's centennial edition of Du Bois's The Soul of Black Folk. Um, I also want to just say to you that uh, the Reverend Dr. Jilks is, has been, and will, will be a very fine mentor and colleague um, for those of us in the African American womanist community and um, a celebrated preacher, uh, particularly uh, for those of us here in Cambridge. So thank you and welcome panel. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here and this is truly a place for which our fathers and mothers sighed. I also, and in uh, response to, I, I first of all want to follow in the footsteps of others and thank Professor Marla Frederick, Professor Wallace Best, and Mr. Mar Mar Marlon Milner, thank you, for their tremendously wonderful work in getting us here and conceiving this and putting this together. Um, my good friend Bob Franklin asked me to also mention that when Dr. King gave his last sermon on April 3rd, 1968, he was in the Charles Harrison Mason Temple Church of God in Christ. And that is so inadequately documented, particularly in the press, because they keep calling it the Masonic Temple. And they think it, you know, Masons and Shriners. But Charles Harrison Mason Temple Church of God in Christ, from Riverside Church to Kojic. God is good. And it is my job, and let me do this quickly and briefly, to introduce our wonderful panel this afternoon. Uh, we have four stellar lights who are doing great work, high energy work. Professor David Daniels comes to us from McCormick Theological Seminary where um, he joined the faculty in 1987. And yes, you can read about people in your program he, has, he is a church historian by training and by practice, and he has been very, very busy publishing articles in a variety of places so that the rest of us have material with which to work when we need to speak. <coughs> Professor Clarence Hardy is at Dartmouth College after having been at Rollins College in Winter Park, and he is enduring the trauma of understanding northern New England after <laughs> Florida. He specializes in American religious culture, and he has a wonderful new book, book out. It's not brand, brand new, but it's, it's new. It's still in the reviewing stages. James Baldwin's God, Sex, Hope, and Crisis in Black Holiness Culture. And we are looking forward to his book, We Grappled for the Mysteries, Black God Talk in Modern America. Professor Leslie Callahan is at the University of Pennsylvania, and she is there a, an assistant professor of American religious history and African American religion. She is hard at work. Her dissertation titled Fleshly Manifestations, 
Charles Fox Parham's Quest for the Sanctified Body, have mercy, will be published in the monograph series supplemental to the Journal of Pentecostal Theology. Her work in progress includes Family Altars, Visions and Revisions of the Family in Pentecostal Culture, 1900 to 1940. That work will discuss early Pentecostal understandings of family responsibilities and the gospel. Last but not least, Professor Shane Lee comes to us today from the University of Houston, and he is on his way to Tulane. He uh, a PhD from Northwestern. He has a forthcoming book titled American Phenomenon, Bishop T.D. Jakes. And he is, is busy at work interviewing African American women ministers to learn about their ministry. He is a sociologist at work on the work of the ministry. I look forward to seeing that work. Let me not take up any more time because they have limited time and we want to have time for vibrant discussion. Each will go in the order listed on your program, Professor Daniels, Professor Hardy, Professor Callahan, and Professor Lee, and each will have 15 minutes to make his or her presentation, and I should alert them to the fact that my good friend, Professor Arlene Kaplan Daniels, has referred to me in my tasks as moderator as the Iron Chancellor, and I have my clock. So let us go to. There was a variety of greetings that um, I've heard today, but one that I was raised on is peace be unto the saints, and peace be multiplied was the response. Um, I am very grateful to be here, and I'll be short on that, but I want to thank the committee and uh, this conference. The, the title of my presentation is, In a World of Transition and Mighty Changes, uh, The Church of God in Christ as a Global Presence. I'd like to begin by saying that I'm focusing on three questions. What are the features that constitute the global presence of Kojic, the acronym for Church of God in Christ? What is the cultural impact of U.S. Kojic on Kojic in other countries? And then finally, what happens when Kojic inserts itself into the global religious order? I'll pass by the fact that Kojic is included in the seven historic black churches, that while there are um, over 100 African-American denominations in the U.S., um, some estimate that probably 50% of those uh, Pentecostals belong to the Church of God in Christ. Thirdly, that Kojic is present um, in over two and a half times as many countries than any other black denomination uh, in the United States. Um, it, Kojic is in approximately 50 countries. The next two denominations to come close to that are the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World and the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which have about 20, or in about 20 countries. So therefore, this Kojic then is not only unique in its size, but it's also unique in being a global uh, denomination. Kojic also ranks, uh, Kojic is also present at this time on all six continents. Um, and therefore, it then is this global uh, uh, denomination that has been shaped by the ministry of missionaries who traveled from the United States to different countries, by nationals who came from different countries as immigrants and then went back to their home countries um, carrying the Kojic message. And then finally, by U.S. military families uh, in Japan and Germany and other places, open up Kojic congregations um, before they left those countries. I'm not exactly sure how many members in the Church of God in Christ, and to be honest, only God knows. <laughs> but there's somewhere between uh, three and six million, um, and that, um, so therefore these numbers then include those that are abroad. Um, Consequently, because of the fact that Kojic is on, on all six continents, the global presence of Kojic is multiracial, multiethnic, and multinational. Um, as you would expect, um, in Africa, the Caribbean, and, um, and in Latin America, the members are nationals. In Asia, in India, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines, they're also nationals. Um, in Japan and Korea, uh, they tend to be uh, African-American expatriates or military families, though there are some um, nationals that are present in Europe. Um, in Great Britain, they tend to be uh, Jamaicans or of Jamaican descent. 
um, while in Germany and Italy, they tend to be U.S. families. On, in Africa and in South and Central America, uh, Kojic is on 18 countries on each continent. Um, and just to give a sense of the statistics, that the largest concentration of Kojic, and these are, ni- uh, are, these are 2000, uh, uh, 19, uh, 2000, the year 2000 statistics, there was about 150 congregations in Haiti, 110 congregations in, Liber- in uh, India, 100 in Liberia, uh, 85 in uh, South Africa, 90, 85 in Nigeria, 80 within Mexico. Consequently, when you look at those numbers, one realizes that the vast majority of Kojic outside the United States um, are nationals in these places. I'd like to say that Kojic um, is, the Kojic global presence is marked by um, a couple of features. One feature is that they went beyond parochialism to blending together Pan-Africanism and a solidarity with people of color. Two, they went from being bilateral to multilateral. Three, from being monocentristic to being polycentristic. And four, from cultural importing or importation to cultural hybridity. Within on global Pentecostalism, Kojic projects a moderate form of theological Protestantism and possesses the ingredients of progressive form of a socially engaged Pentecostalism. So first, this, this moving from being parochial to blending together uh, Pan-Africanism and a solidarity with people of color. Even before Koji became Pentecostal in 1907, there was already um, a mission in Liberia connected with their group. Um, the, it was a medical doctor who served among the Grebo people um, within Liberia. This sort of Pan-Africanist vision of, of, like a number of black churches, of going to blacks in the diaspora first, she also ended up intersecting with Marcus, Garvey, Marcus Garvey's movement, especially through the ministry of the Kojic Bishop Eddie R. Driver in Los Angeles, and there's others. This, this sort of Pan-African vision then had missions go to Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago, uh, Panama, and Liberia, again, um, by the 1920s. But what is interesting, that during the 1920s, this vision of Pan-Africanism was blended with a solidarity with people of color. So during the mid-1920s, missions went to Costa Rica, Mexico, and by the 1930s, to India. So while the international sort of mission orientation go ye into all the world, and possibly a prophecy that Bishop Mason um, is a test that he received that the sun would never set on the Church of God in Christ. That combining that together would spur this initiative is this pan-Africanism and the solidarity with people of color. These movements, then I contend, define the scope of Kojic globally and led to the widening of the Kojic angle, ang, um, angle of vision. Second, these bilateral, multilateral shifts. Um, Kojic begins, as a number of denominations did at this time, sort of center to periphery arrangement. The church um, was within the North America and the churches outside were the, what was called then the foreign fields. And they funded both nationals and foreign missionaries, so therefore there was a different twist than a number of white denominations. <coughs> and these fundings came from three institutions, the missions department, the women's department, and mission-minded congregations. And Kojic then began to fund building of edifices, schools, orphanages, and clinics, especially in Liberia and in Haiti. Now, what is interesting is that this congregational level, you ended up with a number of mission-minded congregations, mission-minded congregations that even till today end up relating to different places. So just quickly, um, Holy Temple in Philadelphia had projects in Liberia and Haiti. Washington Temple in Brooklyn um, had projects in India and Liberia. Emmanuel in Los Angeles had projects in South Africa. Jackson Memorial had projects in Mexico. And you could go through a number of Kojic congregations that directly um, supported and funded certain projects in addition to what the national or international missions department and women's department did. So these bilateral then relationships um, led to this direct funding. But one of the questions arise, was Kojic able to escape, quote, Western paternalism, unquote, in a black face? Or did it re- reproduce Western maternalism like a number of 19th century denominations, um, both black and white? 
I contend that this sort of Western uh, paternalism was muted, wasn't overturned. There, there was a, a blend, there was a mixture of it. And it is seen in the fact that in this direct funding that was there, um, there tended to be funding of particular projects in particular places. It wasn't necessarily spread evenly across um, the places where Kojic was. The second was that they established very early on the existence of both resident bishops and non-resident missionary bishops. Um, there's a saying of a, a bishop in New York who was uh, the bishop of an island in the Caribbean, and they asked him, how often did you get to the island? He said, as often as I can drive over there. <laughs> so, so, but, but this blending, though, meant that there was this tension between the resident bishops who are, who are nationals and these non-resident missionary bishops. But in the 1950s, the Church of God in Christ created a uh, international board of foreign bishops, which then found a, became a caucus for them to begin to explore the issues that they were facing um, and, and, and enabled them then to not then merely relate bilaterally, but began that process of relating in a multilateral way. Um, it ended up being dissolved because of some confusion about its role. However, it ended up spurring um, within Africa, Asia, and Latin America in the 1970s, Kojic-wide conventions of bishops getting together, no longer needing to come to the United States, but they could meet on their own continent. And people like Bishop Buchanan, who was an African-American who lived in Okinawa uh, most of his life, he ended up traveling to India, Philippines, uh, South Korea, and a number of places trying to help multi multilateral relationships as opposed to merely um, these bilateral relationships. The third sort of multilateral shift occurs that it's in the 1980s, Kojic begins to have three specific diasporic communities um, that served as constituencies within the church. The first one um, that starts in the 1950s was the Jamaican diaspora linking first Jamaica and Great Britain, and then later Canada. And there, there is a conduit, and pastors and songs and leaders go between these three places. The second diaspora of the 1980s is the Haitian diaspora that ended up linking Kojic congregations to Haiti, France, Quebec, and South Florida. And then the third is the Asian Indian diaspora, that connects Kojic congregations in India, Sri Lanka, and British Columbia, um, the Western province in Canada. And again, all three of these diasporas um, not only have their language um, relationships, but they also have the circulation of ideas, of people, and of funds. Next, this monocentricity to polycentricity. And there is that you end up with the fact that Memphis ends up being the headquarters of the Church Garden Christ, the birthplace, the place of the annual convocations. But it's not only the place of the annual convocations, but we end up seeing other centers created. Um, Jamaica becomes a center, Haiti becomes a center, India and South Africa end up competing. So for instance, there are two uh, major theological seminaries in Church Garden Christ. One at ITC, the Mason Theological Seminary, and the other, Calvary Theological Seminary in London. Next, this shift from cultural imports to cultural hybridity um, is that on one hand, as Cheryl Thompson Jills talks about, this dual sex system ends up being imposed in other places. So male bishops, women supervisors, the ordination of male ministers, the licensure of women evangelists, these gender relationships then end up being reproduced in these countries. And one has to ask um, what damage and what good um, does it do? Um, let me go on because I have about four minutes that um, you also end up liturgically with the fact that Kojic is not identical in any place outside of the United States. You have different sectors. One is uh, urban Liberia, Morovia, Buchanan, Harper, and Cape Palmas, uh, South Africa, Japan, Great Britain, Germany, Ontario, um, have gospel choirs that sing songs that are sung in the United States. They come to Memphis, learn those songs, and go back as well as buy them. Second, looking at preaching style, that the preaching style also in the U.S. sets a framework for Great Britain, Germany, Japan, and Ontario, uh, especially among Afro-Canadians. According to one source, even Kojic shouting styles informs the shouting in Great Britain, the Dominican Republic, 
and among the Afro-Canadians uh, in Ontario. And then the prayer style um, shapes South Africa, Haiti, Great Britain, and, and uh, but things that are clearly different. Um, within Great Britain, uh, Simon Wallace comments that while the preaching, singing, and shouting resembles U.S., he says that there's something different about what he calls the feel. Quote, he says, we sing the same songs, but most of the time the style differs, and I think it's because the feel that you guys instill, sometimes I think it's because of your roots, unquote. Um, in Haiti, for instance, um, they, they are following the formality of mainline Protestantism. Um, they're undergirded by a parochial system and a commitment to Bible school education. And so therefore they resemble their Lutheran and Baptist and Methodist counterparts, unlike what one finds in the United States. Um, within Zambia, they use drums that have skins as a cover on them, where in Congo they use drums that are hollow. In, 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 in Liberia, their shouting is akin to a shuffle, whereas in Congo, they have this jerking motion of the elbow that they do in unison. In the Congo, they employ a three, which means it's time to pray, and then mean it's time to stop praying. And in Zambia, in the Church of God in Christ, they blow a whistle to say that it's time to end the prayer. And then within Brazil, as well as, as um, uh, Cuba and the Dominican Republic, the Church of God in Christ style is more of a Latin form. They're lively. Um, they're using a variety of musical instruments. According to Roger Vibert, who's in the northern part of Brazil, he says, quote, every instrument is used, unquote, especially the drums. But he says, however, it is white gospel with a Brazilian flair. So globally, Klojic has engaged in, a, quote, absorbing and reformulating influences <coughs> for many quarters, unquote, while maintaining its U.S. Uh, Klojic primary center. Let me move on by saying that um, one of the things that Kojic does when it asserts itself within the global order is that by Kojic's rejection of initial, er of, a, of, a, of initial evidence and of an inerrancy of scripture, it creates a moderate form of theological Protestant, uh, of Pentecostalism. And with its um, ecumenical sensibility and its political liberalism and commitment to social justice, especially in some sectors, then Kojic postures itself as opposing religious and political fundamentalism and, and anticipating a form of progressive Pentecostalism. If I had time, I would note the writers like Franklin and others and Bishop McKinney who are our sources uh, for that. Um, lastly, let me comment that within the global scene, Kojic inserts itself then by, number one, being a form of Christianity that was birthed in the West but has resonance and connections with Africa and therefore serves as a symbol within the global religious order of being almost like a non-Western form of Christianity that emerges in the West and yet challenges white supremacy and the alliance between whiteness and Christianity on a global scene. And then next, that Kojic, one minute, next, that Kojic ends up then being a place that, that undergirds a vision of the world that deprivileges, deprivileges the West um, as the arena of Christianity along with Europe, North America, and Australia and, 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 and um, elicits cosmologies that are able to resonate with cosmologies around the two-thirds world. Finally, um, how does Kojic then, what happens when Kojic inserts itself into the global order? Uh, Kojic creates one of the few black-led networks that, cre that connect congregations in over 50 countries into one organization. It, in blending together this pan-Africanism and a solidarity with people of color, Kojic then becomes a multiracial, multicultural, multi-continental religious movement. As a major presence within global Pentecostalism, Kojic provides a vital alternative to uh, uh, fun Pentecostal fundamentalism and its other manifestations. And by being, if it could be, more theologically astute and developing its form of moderate theological Pentecostalism, and if it could develop a political savvy in creating a progressive form of socially engaged Pentecostalism, Kojic then could be a major constructive actor on the global scene. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Uh, it seems that I am the 
resident theologian among the group, although I think I disappoint Jim Cohn on almost a daily basis. <laughs> I'm not much of a constructive theologian. I do think of myself more as a historical theologian. Uh, but don't tell my current employer that that's, <laughs> that's where I am. The title for my discussion today um, is No Shame in the Flesh, Black Pentecostalism as Urban Religion. Um, I think I will begin by making a reference to Arthur Fawcett, who wrote uh, his famous book on black gods of the metropolis. And I was doing some work uh, recently, a year or two ago, and I tripped up on this testimony that didn't make the book. Um, and it's quite clear that the testimony uh, is, well, he describes uh, a Mrs. Uh, w, who he describes as a middle-aged colored woman, and an ardent worker in the holiness group, in a holiness group, it's quite clear to me, if you look at the testimony carefully, that it's probably a oneness group. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't make the book. And it's an interesting testimony because it captures the uh, sense of being in between, caught between North and South, uh, rural and, and urban. Um, uh, and I think what I'll do is read an extended portion of this, and then I'll have some comments for uh, reconceiving our thinking about black Pentecostalism. This is what she says. I had come to Philadelphia from Virginia, and I felt depressed. I knew I needed something, but I didn't know just what. I looked outside my house one day, and there were men gambling on the doorstep. I never had seen anything like that before, and I couldn't get over it. I said to myself, oh, if I only had more power, I could keep men from gambling like that. <laughs> then one day I had a dream. I felt myself lifted up on a high mountain. It was so high I could look and see over the world. When I looked behind me, it seemed as if the sun was going down right at my back. It looked like it does in the country. Looks like if you went to the edge end of the field, you could touch it. Then a voice said to me, this represents the son of God. It's almost down. You must warn men and women to be holy. I rushed down from the mountain crying. When I, went, when I got down, there was a host of people waiting for me to listen to me. I talked to them. Then I woke up. Things went on so and so for two or three days. Then the same thing appeared in the kitchen where, while I was doing dishes. I was wide awake. I clapped my hands. Then I went to a woman and asked her, what should I do? And she said, go down to one of those churches. I'll skip a piece here. There were sanctified people there. When I walked in, I felt the spirit. I said, I'm converted. I know I am. I'm leading a clean life in these times, but I need more power. <laughs> They said, yes, come in on Monday. We have Terry meetings for people who want the Holy Ghost. My husband laughed at me. He said, aren't you converted already? What was the matter with the Baptist church where you got converted in Virginia. And this is the key, this is the key portion here. But in Virginia, we would have been ashamed to go to a holiness church. The people in the little towns down there all know each other, and this makes them afraid to be different. But we were in Philadelphia now. And in this big city, 
we didn't have to worry about what our friends might think. Now, there's so much to talk about in just that testimony. Um, I remember hearing from my wife a similar story. I said, you need to go preach. You know, she said, I'm, I'm committed to teaching. I'm committed to teach." No, that sounds like a preaching call to me. And it doesn't seem like it was ever realized in this woman's, uh, in this woman's life. Uh, but I do want to lift up three concerns that I think emerged for me in terms of thinking about um, this particular testimony. The first I had labeled before at coming here is a sense of being a modern religious expression. And the term that's been floating around here is hybridity. Right? And if you think about the, the very uh, testimony, right, she begins by talking about, in her inner language, right, the, uh, there's, there's all these motifs of country. Right? Then one day I had a dream, you know, lifted up on a high mountain, and then she says, I look back, and it looks like it does in the country. Looks like if you went to the end of the field, you could touch it. Uh, and so one of the curious things, and one of the things that we can see in the modern situation is this kind of uh, blending of southern, um, southern religiosity and a northern climate, and the kind of interpenetration that we see in her testimony of north and south, of bodies and industry. Later in her testimony, she says something very curious, uh, at least to me. And let me skip down. This is after she says the people tell her that you need to be calling on Jesus' name. That's an indication that it's apostolic testimony. Uh, and this is what she says. I got baptized that way all over again, and now I have the power. When you get the power, the spirit of God gets all in your flesh. It's very great, just like an electric shock. It makes him move all through you. And then she talks about some of the words, of the prayer words, hallelujah, Lord, glory, Jesus, and so on um, in, in the testimony. Now, what's curious about this to me, anyway, is, and we see this in a number of cultural expressions that emerge in the North. I'm thinking about jazz and um, uh, other situations where we get a uh, blending of human fleshly uh, sensibilities with uh, modern technology. And I'm thinking uh, the best example I can think of this is from Zora Neale Hurston's uh, char 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 Characteristics of Negro Expression. And she talks about uh, a local uh, woman who sings in the juke joint. Uh, and she describes that it ain't good looks that will keep you and your lover satisfied. And then the crowd comes back and says, what is it then, good mama? <laughs> and then she says, Elgin movements in your hips, 20 years guarantee. And she's referring to the precision of a, market, of, of a watch, right? So she's talking about her own body, and she's comparing that to uh, uh, instruments of technology. Uh, we see this in other realms of religious experience. I think, again, of A.W. Dix, one of his famous sermons that was recorded in 1927. He calls out the, the stops on the way to hell. Right? He calls out in a voice very much like a train conductor would. Right? Um, but the point of the narrative, the testimony anyway, for me, is that we see in her description of electric shock the ways in which Industry and technology become, shape the content of the religious experience itself. Right? So it's not just a question of form. Right? It's also a question of how it shapes uh, conceptions of religious experience. So what we see in um, Mrs. W, at least on the first level that I wanted to talk a little bit about, was this sense of hybridity or modernness that blends together southernness and uh, in the realm of industry and commerce. 
My goodness. <laughs> I, I, need, I need more power. Let me hurry along. Mrs. W, free from the gaze of uh, her neighbors, alone but intensely involved in, a, in the exilic communi uh, community and desperate for power to confront old temptations made new in the urban bustle, was now free to embrace a kind of God that got into your flesh. Years before this testimony in 1926, Langston Hughes, in his famous manifesto, Negro Artist in the Racial Mountain, you know, he describes the, bl the blare of Negro jazz bands and the bellowing voice of Bessie Smith. And it, you can see within, I need more power. <laughs> in that manifesto, I think, you see the arrival of the shameless in black expressive culture. Five minutes, okay. Um, and Hughes is an interesting figure in and of himself because he, he's captivated by sanctified religion. And there's a wonderful story that he tells, uh, uh, I can't remember, Blues I've Been Playing or something like along those lines, where he describes uh, sanctified religion in contrast with the fashionable religion of established churches. And he describes sanctified religion as a religion of joy. Uh, and I think what we find with a lot of religious migrants is they knew about this religion of joy. Let me read a section from a letter that's been published widely, both in Cernet's text and also in They Look for a City and, and New Negro. Uh, uh, sisters writing uh, uh, to another sister, uh, she's in Chicago, and she writes something along these lines. The, the weather and everything else was a surprise to me. She's talking about Chicago now. Uh, when I came, I got here in time to attend one of the greatest revivals in the history of my life. Over 500 people joined the church. We had a Holy Ghost shower. You know I like to have run wild. It was snowing some nights, and if you didn't hurry, you could, you could, you could not get standing room. And one of the hallmarks that we can find in lots of testimonies uh, of people who join Kojic churches um, uh, in Chicago and other northern cities is that Kojic always had revivals. Mm -hmm. You know, you could always have a good time, right, in, in these Kojic churches right, where you weren't, you weren't concerned about being publicly respectable. Here's another letter here. Actually, it's another version of this same letter that I haven't been able to find in Cernet, but it's changed in some other renditions of this. It says, uh, she writes to a sister, pray for me. I am heaven bound. Let me know if you are coming soon, as I will meet you at the railroad and bring you to my house. And what a good time we will have thanking God and going to church. Church is a good time. And I'm trying to compare that to the good time that you can think in more secular settings. And I think that's one of the things, one of the ways of looking at uh, black Pentecostalism as urban uh, religion. All right, uh, I'm running out of time, I know. Um, but I do want to talk about the last category uh, very quickly. And for me, it has to do with uh, nation or community. Uh, Going back to a good friend and teacher, mentor of mine, the late Baptist historian James Washington, who described uh, the Baptist quest at the end of the 19th century as a quest for social power. And beneath this quest and ambition for social power, uh, you have the language of racial uplift and respectability to overcome, in Washington's words, the, the legacy of social invisibility fostered by white racism. One of the strains that we find quite clearly within holiness, early holiness discourse in the 1890s is a dispute about this kind of collective identity, right? 
uh, C.P. Jones would say denominationalism is slavery, right? Where he, he suggests that the building of this denomination, he's speaking about black Baptists here, is a reenactment of brutal white uh, domination. Uh, and another, another phrase here, thinking again of Jones, you know, he wanted to walk away from corrupt, uh, unscriptural denominationalism, unscriptural names and methods, man-made constitutions and institutions to return to the New Testament names and leadership of the Spirit of God. I think we can look at Mrs. W's uh, discussion here in that same context. This rejection of the respectable, or at least that grounded in collective identities, institutionalized in independent churches like Baptists and Methodists, gather new substance by those who claim Azusa as their spiritual birthplace. Even as others would transform their claims of collective identity away from respectable uplift to a more sharper, the sharper language of nationhood and self-determination, the heirs of holiness would signal their new communal claims with new names for their religious institutions that no longer simply embrace the language of the Bible, but affirm during the interwar period in scores of institutional names, language of all nations. The old concerns of Jones and Mason against traditional forms of collective identity would find new life in cities like Philadelphia, where religionists, away from the constraining eyes of neighbors, were free and desperate enough to revel in the God that was truly electric in the flesh. Pentecostals would not go as far as others would in using the ever-present vessel of the fleshly human body to conceive the divine, but many would appreciate the verve of those outside the confines of Christian identity even. Uh, going back to Mrs. W and her, she revels in the cacophony of divine invocations that Pentecostal services had. She says, you know, there are some words that are just too powerful, are very powerful. The most powerful is hallelujah. That's the strongest. Then there is, thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. Glory, Jesus, and so on. Father, Father Divine, she's speaking of, would be all right, but it's all wrong making him out to be God. All right. I'll leave it there. I want to join my thanks to those who've come before me um, and uh, say to uh, Professor Frederick, Professor Best, and someday Professor Milner um, how grateful I am to be on this panel. Um, that's a combination feeling. Um, I would rather be sitting out and enjoying the panel presentations with you, but I'll do my job and then I'll get to enjoy Professor Lee. The goal of my presentation today, which is titled, Who is a Black Pentecostal? The Case of Thoreau Harris, um, is to complicate and problematize the question of what defines a black Pentecostal in the practice of and scholarship about Pentecostalism through a discussion of the hymn writer Thoreau Harris. The Dictionary of Pentecostal and Charismatic Movements describes him as follows, and uh, it is interesting that all of the Pentecostal uh, scholars that I'll be quoting, unlike the student presentation I sat in on, none of them are here, um, and it's probably best. Anyway, <laughs> black composer and publisher, a child prodigy whose compositions in the Methodist holiness style found appreciation among Pentecostals. Harris published the first of his several hymnals in about 1900. His wide range of musical interests reflected his classical training and acquaintance with the church music tradition. As owner of Windsor Music Company in Chicago, he associated with well-known figures in gospel music, including Peter Billhorn, James Rowe, and Henry Day. End quote. Black composer and publisher. 
The problem is Harris did not define himself in print as a black composer. To the contrary, all extant documents of Harris's adulthood, from his marriage licenses to his death certificate, all identify him as white. We could question whether in his later life Harris also ceased, at least by way of affiliation, to define himself as Pentecostal, but that discussion would push me past the limits of our presentation time. The question that I want to explore in this context is a racial one. What makes a person black? in the context of the Pentecostal movement, and what difference does blackness make? I'll begin by sketching Harris's biography and his role in the Pentecostal movement, and then I'll focus on his later years in Eureka Springs, Kansas, uh, excuse me, Arkansas, where he lived from 1932 until his death in 1955. Thoreau Harris was born in Washington, D.C. in 1874. After studying music and beginning to write songs as a small child, he entered college at age 15 in Battle Creek, <coughs> Michigan, uh, at a Seventh-day Adventist college where he learned music theory. Having returned to Washington, in 1903, Harris received a letter from Peter Billhorn, a gospel songwriter whose songs were often sung by revivalists at the turn of the century. Billhorn invited him to move to Chicago, which he did with his first wife and child in tow. In Chicago, after an association with the gospel songwriter George Meyer, Harris formed his own Windsor publishing house and published songbooks, including Songs of His Coming, which was widely advertised in Pentecostal circles, including Charles Parham's Apostolic Faith in 1914. Apparently at this time, Harris was also involved in the Lake Street Mission, which Parham visited as an evangelist in 1916. According to Robert Cunningham, a Pentecostal source about whom I'll speak later, Harris testified to having been baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1913 during services conducted by Maria Woodworth Etter, a healing evangelist known for her interracial meetings. After more than 25 years in Chicago, in 1932, he and his third wife, Frida, moved from Chicago to Eureka Springs, Arkansas, where Harris lived until his death in 1955. In Arkansas, Harris became the church organist for a Christian church, Disciples, and the Methodist Church South in the community. In 1936, Frida died of smallpox. In 1937, he wed his fourth wife, Ruby Bryant, who became his widow, in a ceremony in Eureka Springs, officiated by the pastor of the Methodist Church. A prolific hymn writer throughout his career, Harris penned at least 250 hymns in the holiness style. His most famous hymns are He's Coming Soon, sung to the tune of uh, Hawaiian Queen Lula Kalani's Oloa'i, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus, and Jesus Loves the Little Children, which is all, not always attributed to him. His most specifically Pentecostal hymn, Pentecost, Pentecost in My Soul, reads in part, To me the Holy Ghost is given, and earnest of the joys of heaven, since he has taken full control, I have Pentecost in my soul. The refrain, I have Pentecost in my soul, I have Pentecost in my soul. The Spirit has come, has come to abide, I have Pentecost in my soul. Harris's racial identity came to my attention during the writing of my dissertation as I explored the relationship between black and white people in the Pentecostal movement in its earliest expressions. I was examining the breakup between Charles Parham and William Seymour in an effort to understand Parham's motivations and the specifically racial, not theological, dimensions. To be sure, Parham's description of Azusa Pentecostalism in terms of the buck nigger interacting with whiteness's most pristine symbol, the refined white woman, could hardly fail um, to demonstrate that racism was at its base. Yet some of his biographers, that is Parham's, had claimed that to call Parham racist represented a contemporary preoccupation with race that was not consistent with early Pentecostal options. Parham in this reading was more paternalistic than racist, especially in his pre-1907 interactions with Seymour. In this context, Grant Wacker, who is not here, in particular used Thoreau Harris's blackness and Charles Parham's interactions with him to offset suspicions of Parham's racism. That is, because Harris and Parham corresponded over the course of a decade, and because Harris had complimentary things to say about Parham's visit to his Chicago Lake Street mission, then Parham could be at least partially rehabilitated. As I sought to define the boundaries of Parham's white supremacy, which I assumed, I endeavored to investigate the relationship between Parham and known black people, including Harris. But I could never escape the fact that, at least in the writings of Parham, he never in any way describes 
Harris in the way he describes other black people. Like most people of his time and ours, Parham always marked black people as black. Lucy Farrow was a colored governess. J.R. Yarbrough, one of Parham's students, uh, his testimony of conversion was a, uh, to his testimony of conversion was appended an addendum recommending him as a preacher to any of the colored missions. Who, I wondered, said that Thoreau Harris is black? Thoreau Harris's file at the Eureka Springs Historical Museum, which includes his death certificate and marriage certificates, only complicated my questions about who applied the label black to Harris, as all of his legal documents listed him as white. None of the references I found about him in his lifetime identify him as black or colored. Three of his four wives are also identified as white in official records. His third wife was German. His fourth white ruby was, a, was white and born in Mississippi. His own short autobiographical statement gives no indication of a racial identity other than white. The pictures of Harris are, not surprisingly, indeterminate. <laughs> Har <laughs> Harris is primarily identified as black by Pentecostal sources. Carl Brumbach's classic test text on the Assemblies of God, Suddenly from Heaven, includes the following quotation, which is so telling that I really have to read it all. The American Negro has made a permanent impression, oh, this is a footnote, by the way. The American Negro, Negro has made a permanent impression upon the Pentecostal movement, contributing some of its most outstanding personalities. W.J. Seymour, the founder of Azusa Street Mission. G.T. Haywood, composer of Jesus the Son of God, I see a crimson stream of blood, et cetera. Let me say as an aside, as an apostolic Pentecostal, that that's all he had to say about Haywood is problematic. But anyway, et cetera. Uh, composer of Jesus, the Son of God, I see a crimson stream of blood, et cetera. Thorough Harris who wrote all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He's coming soon, more abundantly. By his stripes we are healed. Pentecost in my soul. Jesus loves the little children and other favorites, end quote. At the Assemblies of God archives, there's an article by Robert Cunningham, who was a student at Central Bible Institute in Springfield, Missouri, when Thoreau Harris visited there in 1936. Cunningham described Harris as a handsome black man and admitted that his assumption that Thoreau Harris was black was based largely on Harris's appearance to him. Although Cunningham quickly added that Harris was a refined speaker and obviously well-educated as well as handsome black man. As an aside, it strikes me as a bit ironic that given the subjectivity of aesthetic judgments, it is likely that Cunningham thought Harris to be a handsome black man precisely because of how white he looked. And although I cannot prove it, I suspect that the same kind of judgment was at play in Cunningham's description of Thoreau Harris's refinement. I dare say that most black people in this room have had the experience of being described as articulate <laughs> in a patronizing way by someone who seems to expect you to be something else. <laughs> Given the contest between Thoreau Harris's own self-identification and other person's observations and ascriptions, who gets to say whether Thoreau Harris is black or not? In the United States, as I'm sure you are well aware, the issue of race is tinged with complexity that has had historical implications, not only culturally, but also legally. The 2000 census notwithstanding, one's own racial self-identification has not historically been the determinative factor in racial classification, asked Tiger Woods. In his book, who is black? One Nation's Definition, sociologist F. James Davis traces the history of racial classification in the United States. I quote him, to be considered black in the United States, not even half of one's ancestry must be African black. But will one fourth do or one eighth or less? The nation's answer to the question who is black has long been that a black person is any person with any known African black ancestry, also known as the one drop rule. A single drop of black blood makes one black, a single black ancestor. Why then is Thoreau Harris, who census records indicate probably does have a black ancestor, why is he saying he's white? The reasons for Thoreau Harris's self-identification as white are undefined as far as Harris's own writings are concerned, obviously. 
But at least part of the answer may be found in the legal prescriptions concerning miscegenation or intermarriage between the races. Defining himself as black would have prohibited his legal cohabitation with his wives, all of them, and rendered his children not only colored but illegitimate. The issues at play in miscegenation are complicated, as recent books demonstrate. But it's useful to mention that anti-miscegenation legislation and enforcement reveal the strict prohibition against interracial intimacy, read relationships, not so much against interracial sex. Sexual interactions had existed between black and white persons for centuries, not just in the oft-repeated context of coerced sexual activity in the era of slavery. But it's the issue of relationships between black people and white people that the miscegenation legislation is really enforced. During Thoreau Harris's lifetime, um, such, union as, such unions as his um, in marriage to three, likely four white women, um, were illegal in 38 states, including Illinois and Arkansas, where he resided his entire adult life not only illegal, but also dangerous in the lynching culture of the 20th century. Although Eureka Springs was not one of the sites of any known race riots in the early 20th century, um, it was between Tulsa and uh, um, uh, Springfield, Missouri, um, it, it was home to, and it was home to, by the time of Thoreau Harris's arrival, a decreasing population of black people, largely among the servant class, who lived in a segregated neighborhood in the middle of town. Just 40 miles away, the town of Harrison, Arkansas, um, was the site of, um, uh, of, a, of a race riot, of two race riots, in fact, in 1905 and in 1909 um, um, that were rooted in economic discord because of the failure of a railroad venture, but that found their expression in the allegations of Negro men speaking disrespectfully to white women. The Harrison tensions erupted in violence um, in, a, in violence which was not simply intended, uh, historians uh, uh, conclude, to put black people in their place, but intended to purge the community entirely of black people. Even in Eureka Springs, by the 1920s and 30s, the black population had dwindled, uh, both because of attrition due to changing economic circumstances and, according to some, uh, KKK activity that was designed to co coerce black people to leave. Even within the Pentecostal movement, there was no widely shared assumption about the, uh, in favor, excuse me, of social integration among the races. Charles Parham's vituperations about the buck nigger and the refined white woman had some sort of audience after all. Thoreau Harris was the black buck with the white woman, married to a white woman from Mississippi at his death in 1955. To put it bluntly, Thoreau Harris died in 1955 after a combined 40 years of marriage to four different white women, and his death widowed a Mississippi white woman in the same year that Emmett Till died for allegedly whistling at one. All right, to, to kind of wrap this up. Um, there are a lot of interesting things about Thoreau Harris himself, um, but I won't conclude on those. Let me say something about the implications, uh, what I think is going on um, in terms of the implications of Harris's racial identity for Pentecostal scholarship. It seems to me that this plays into the, an issue that has been discussed, at least in brief, this morning, um, and that is the, conte the, the contested quest for a rehabilitated white founder um, of Pentecostalism, namely Par Par Charles Parham. Um, one might say a white father in Charles Parham that's expressed most succinctly in Wacker's Heaven Below when Wacker attempts to use Harris's blackness and Parham's seemingly harmonious, though admittedly paternalistic, you know, fatherly, interaction with Parham. By his quick reference to Parham, that is Harris's quick reference to Parham, and the love for the message and the messenger when Parham visited the Lake Street Mission, um, Harris is expressing, at least in the way I'm conceiving Wacker's taking of it, um, Wacker's basically saying that of Parham that he was a father and black people liked it. But Harris's life as a self-identified white man calls 
all of these things into question, including the boundaries between white and black um, that we've been using all day. First, it's almost certain, um, having studied Parham, I can say, it's almost certain that Parham did not know that Harris was white. Parham was vocally, stridently opposed to miscegenation, as most of you know. It is unlikely that he would have fellowshipped with Harris, a black man married to a white woman, even in Chicago. Second, the second issue follows after the first. This means that Pentecostalism's putative, and disputed certainly in this crowd, but not so much in general mainstream um, historical scholarship on, on Pentecostalism, which basically takes Parham's fatherhood for granted. Uh, Pentecostalism's then putative white father was not then equally fatherly to all of Pentecostalism's converts. And then third, my last point, even if you could redeem Charles Parham, and even if you could <laughs> make him the, the white father, the white father of Pentecostalism, it still wouldn't make Pentecostalism white. If one applies the same standard to the Pentecostal movement in the United States that Pentecostals apply to Thoreau Harris, that is the one drop rule, yeah. Pentecostalism itself, despite all of its intermarriages in racially segregated climates and states, yeah. is as black yeah. as Thoreau Harris. I first want to say it's an honor to be here among these great minds here, people of uh, far smarter than I am and accomplished far more, so I'm, I'm very honored to be standing before you. Um, let me read you my title, Great Jazz, Black Neo-Pentecostalism and Our Postmodern World. Mm. First thing I'm going to discuss real briefly is some of you may have even attended this conference. There was a conference a couple of months ago called the Samuel Proctor Conference, and it had uh, leading uh, preachers from all over the country, over 800, coming together. One of the major themes of the conference was what do we do with all of these, these neo-Pentecostal megachurches that aren't responding with the sort of social justice gospel that uh, the black church is supposed to have, as if there's sort of, there's an essence to the black church that they're avoiding. And that was one of the, the themes of the conference. And it, 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 it developed rich dialogue about that and suggestions about social justice. This talk is kind of a uh, response to that major theme of the conference. Let me begin with a quote. This quote is by uh, Miles Davis. I'm sure you're thinking, what does Miles Davis have to do with black Pentecostalism? <laughs> Some of you don't know, but he was, he was a Kojic preacher. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Miles Davis? <laughs> if there's a church mother here, she'd have said the devil is a liar. Miles Davis. <laughs> I heard some people say, yeah, that's right. When I said that, what you up, God? Let me read you this quote. <laughs> this is from his autobiography. I really like Winton, and you know he's talking about Winton. I really like Winton when I first met him. He's still a nice young man, only confused. I knew he could play the hell out of, excuse me, I'm just reading a quote. <laughs> I knew he could play the hell out of classical music and had great technical skills on the trumpet, techniques and all of that. But you need more than that to play great jazz music. You need feelings and an understanding of life that you can only get from living, from experience. Miles Davis uh, was sort of a critic of classical music. He could play it, he was tra classically trained, but he was a critic because he felt that anybody can play classical music. All you have to do is practice, practice, practice. But to play jazz, you have to begin with a tradition, but you have to be able to create in the moment to meet the demands of the moment. 
And so I think jazz lends itself as a good metaphor for religion because successful, vibrant religion is religion that is able to play jazz, to meet the demands of the moment, to take the tradition, but to adjust it to the existential needs and the cultural taste of the people that it's trying to reach. And if it doesn't accomplish that, that's when you have religion in decline. So when we're looking historically, you could see different individuals playing jazz with the gospel to meet the demands of the moment. The Apostle Paul. It wasn't Peter that, that spread the gospel in Hellenistic world. It was Paul because he, he was able to contextualize the gospel for the Hellenistic world. He was able to argue with philosophers. He was more cosmopolitan than the rest of the disciples. You have um, St. Augustine. Some of you who have been trained on the grammatical historical approach to hermeneutics, you kind of cringe when uh, you read his allegorical method of interpretation. But some, some historians say that he helped save Christianity in the northern region of Africa and other places because of his platonic approach to scripture. He was able, in his own way, contextualize his approach to meet his audience. And uh, David Daniels wrote an excellent article about Christianity in Africa. This was about 10 years ago, I guess, how there's a strategic moment because Christianity, people think it's a European you know, religion. It, it was beginning in northern Africa before it hit Europe. And it was a strategic moment for the faith to be spread throughout Africa. But the people in northern Africa were not able to penetrate the gospel to the uh, more commoners, the, the people who weren't as elite. And therefore, they lost the strategic opportunity to Islam because they weren't able to play jazz with the gospel. If you look at early U.S. history, we're here in Massachusetts. You've got the Congregationalists. They used to dominate early American religion. They disappeared because, you know, the American frontier life, the Baptists and the Methodists were able to contextualize the gospel for these rugged individuals who lived these hard lives on the Western front. So um, you have to play jazz in order to survive in a competitive religious economy. They're playing jazz with the gospel. Now, when we talk about the black church, we're talking about something that rose, arose out of a historical crisis, the slave experience. The existential experience of a slave was one of crisis. How do you survive in a nation where you're considered subhuman? How do you su survive the absurdity of being a slave in a free nation? So the invisible institution arose out of sort of this existential crisis of the slave experience. People went off to the swamps and was able to have their emotional release and worship God and feel human. And then you had the black church emerge out of, you know, with that same need. The black church originally, one of its primary uh, reasons for being was survival, our individual survival, was to, as an escape from dehumanization, from, from being subjugated. Uh, from being segregated in the integrated churches. So you have denominations, particularly black denominations, arising out of a particular need. They don't just develop ex nihilo. They, these things arise out of particular needs. But that may mean that denominations have a timeline of utility because new needs develop. And if we don't play jazz and contextualize the gospel to these new needs, then we become irrelevant. And so the, 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 the goal is to be able to play jazz with the gospel. And some of us were able, can do it, and some of us can't. So and that's and something important to think about when you think of uh, Pentecostalism. Um, Robert Franklin did an excellent job when he was discussing the different eras, the AME era, the Baptist era, the Pentecostal era. Some people suggest that the traditional Pentecostal era, as far as black Pentecostals, is almost at the age where you have to raise an eyebrow and say, maybe it's not your time anymore. Maybe it's the neo-Pentecostal era right now. That's, the, that's in question right now. Maybe it's these, these new type of Pentecostals. Sierra Lincoln and Lawrence Mamiya gave us that name, neo-Pentecostal. These, these Pentecostals that put less emphasis in doctrine and more emphasis in experience. That take the vibrant expression of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they leave behind the legalism of traditional Pentecostalism. And so black leaders traditionally in history have arose to play jazz with the gospel. And we have some of them in here. Bishop Pearson played jazz when he developed his Azusa Fellowship. It was a, a new, vibrant expression for Pentecostals. It, it, it gave us a facelift in the world. It, showed, it gave us a sort of business-savvy, high, business, high-tech look that, hey, you know, we're Pentecostal, but we can sort of, you know, keep our heads up. 
he was able to, to on television, to present this new image of being a, a Pentecostal. Bishop Morton played jazz when he, when he formed his Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship. We've got Bishop Luda here. These are individuals who understand the postmodern era that we live in and are able to contextualize the gospel using their tradition, but then using their gospel to meet the particular needs of the people they're reaching. Um, we have AMEs who, in this neo-Pentecostal world, have adjusted sort of their faith to, um, to take the vibrancy of what the Pentecostal movement gave us, but to keep many of their Methodist traditions. So um, we have uh, some very dynamic people here. We have Frank Reed here, who is one of the, the AME people who are playing jazz with the gospel. So same with Floyd Flake. These in the law and. Me and Dr. Reed were talking about this earlier. The largest black AME church, well, that's, uh, uh, that's redundant. The largest AME churches are um, neo Pentecostal. They have these, these praise and worship, these vibrant expressions. And so these traditional churches are starting to die. I, I did my uh, dissertation in Illinois, and there was a church, Olivet Baptist Church, that used to be the large, one of the largest black churches in the country. You go there now, there's 200 members, barely. You go to Salem, which is like 20 years old, they've got close to 20,000 members. They're playing jazz with the gospel, and they're meeting the demands of the moment. Whether this jazz is, you know, the, the qualitative nature of this jazz is not for me to decide. I'll leave it to you theologians and uh, to debate about the nature of that. But they are drawing a lot of people because they're figuring out a way to contextualize the gospel to our postmodern tastes and interests. Now, some of you may be shaking heads saying, how can evangelical Christians be postmodern? I thought, you know, when I think of postmodernism, I think of um, individuals like Derrida, you know, deconstructing truth narratives, Foucault and Leotard. And so how, are, how can you put black neo-Pentecostals in this context of being postmodern? Um, they're not postmodern in the sense of attacking truth, because, you know, neo-Pentecostals believe in the scripture as objective truth. But they are postmodern in the sense that they understand the existential thirst and taste of our contemporary world. They understand how to present a gospel that blends many of the different traditions, that they mix, the mixing of codes, the, the drawing from various sources, um, whether it's self-help, whatever popular psychology, whatever it takes to present the world to a sight and sound generation, these individuals are employing all the tools at their disposal. And that's what playing jazz is all about, taking the tools at your disposal to meet the demands of the moment. And that's uh, what's happening with neo-Pentecostalism. Now I want to uh, conclude by this, I want to conclude by discussing um, very briefly a church that I feel represents this sort of new way of being Pentecostal. It's called Evangel Temple in Greensboro, North Carolina. Has anyone ever attended? Pastor Otis Lockett. Now when you talk to, it's a it's a Kojic church, Church of God in Christ. But when you talk to the members and you say, uh, you know, what kind of church is this? They, they, they'll tell you it's Kojic, but they say, but we're not a traditional Kojic church. So we're kind of a different Kojic church. Well, they represent this sort of neo-Pentecostal Kojic church. And many of the leading Kojic churches have turned to this kind of neo-Pentecostal Kojic church. And so and what they're doing is amazing. They have uh, business empowerment seminars. You can go to Sunday school. I, when I visited, I went to Sunday school class and learned about real estate, learned about investments. I, I, there are things, I mean, that was like five years ago, and I still remember things from that Sunday school class. These members are getting that every week. And so they, they, have a, they just finished a new building where they have a bowling alley. They have a workout facility, basketball courts. They're uh, part of this new generation of, that are creating in the moment to meet the demands of the moment. Now, some of you traditionalists might, might, may feel that, um, that there are some problems in contextualizing the gospel to the cultural tastes of our people. We live in a hyper-capitalist, post-industrial, post-modern society, and why would you want to contextualize the gospel to that type of world? Well, I think that's the challenge that we have to dialogue about. And what, how far do we go? I don't know, and that's a good question for us to think about. Thank you. I will follow the model that Professor Cox gave us earlier and ask the panelists that they have any comments or questions for each other before we open the floor for questions. Going once, 
you're going to follow the model of the, of the other one. <laughs> okay. I see a hand right there, and someone is coming to you with a microphone. Please stand up and say who you are and where you're from and share your question or comment. My name is Ashawn Crawley from Philadelphia. Um, my question, no one touched on it, but I think it's rather important. I'm a musician, um, Church of God in Christ, and, um, or it used to be Church of God in Christ. And my question surrounds the, what do you all as scholars and studiers of Pentecostalism, what do you think the role of the B3, the Hammond B3 has played <laughs> in the church? Particularly, it's interesting now to watch people like Rod Parsley, not really a fan of the theology, but you know, you watch it just to listen to the music. And it's funny that people often talk about a Kojic sound and how it's, yeah. you know, it's infiltrated a lot of churches. A lot of Baptist churches want to have the Kojic sound. And like, I, I'm a musician right now for a Pentecostal church, but it's not Kojic. And it, it is funny to me growing up Kojic and always hearing, well, we try to get that Kojic sound. And just to hear them talk about this Kojic sound, like it's, it's some apex that you're trying to attain. Can you all discuss the, the role of the B3, anything that you've noticed? Brother, because I, I think it's important. Give a talk. <laughs> no, but like, yeah. like having studied Pentecostalism, like, can you talk, like, do you all know the history, and this is something that I'm interested in, the history of when the B3 organ was first used to back up a preacher? Like, and the Lord said, dun, dun, like... <laughs> And I, and, and I like good preaching, but it's like, I listen to a lot of people, and it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm all for, you know, having your own style of church. I really am. But it's just very difficult for me to go to a church service and to not hear a Hammond B3 because it, you feel like you haven't been in church. So as, as the people that have studied this. What have you all noticed about the B3 and its prevalence in the service? First of all, my, my understanding is that the first sort of organ of that type, and I'm not sure if it was a Hammond, but it would have been a, a precursor, was used at the first church of deliverance in Chicago, Illinois, which was a spiritual church. They made a distinction between spiritual and spiritualist. But it wouldn't have been one where you'd heard a dun-dun because uh, Clarence Cobb didn't want that kind of service, though, though they created, they were part of sort of a gospel kind of music. I, I think undergirding your notion of a Kojic sound, though, um, is that, that first of all, um, one of the things that's not really realized, uh, Horace Boyer does this better mm -hmm. than others, yes, is perfect. to say that there are two uh, uh, trajectories that go into the formation of gospel music. One is the famous one by Thomas Dorsey, but the other one is the so-called sanctified right, music right. um, that flows, and that it was the bl blending of those two, and that Sally Martin, who came... <laughs> Uh, from Georgia uh, was one of those sources of that, and that uh, the choirs that emerged at that. Um, but but I do think that one of the areas that has not been developed is that those the music takes different trajectories. That to those who are tuned know the difference between a Maddie Moss Clark song mm -hmm. and a James Cleveland song, mm -hmm. uh, and that the Baptist church is saying one kind of gospel music. And Pentecostal church is saying sometimes Baptist, sometimes not. And, and so I think there, there is something there. On the last part of the musicality of, of, of a, a black church service, um, I do also think you're on to something that, there's, that they develop a shouting music, yeah. a dance yeah. music. Um, and that, that, that then created um, something that undergirds both the dancing and then the preaching. Right. Um, and then lastly, th th there is within this sort of musical culture um, the fact that the, 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 the lines between sacred and secular got blurred. And part of that, I think, was because, number one, um, the devil's music can be sanctified for the Lord's purposes. Right. Mm -hmm. But number two, the saints didn't know they were playing, the, the organists were playing Miles Davis, because they weren't supposed to be listening to their music anyway. <laughs> uh, but, 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 la but lastly, but lastly, a number of the jazz musicians and, the, and the, the liners music talk about the fact that some of the jazz musicians went to the sanctified church to learn riffs and other beats. So there was a blending going back and forth that's there. And I think that's created the sound. And you saw, you saw less of that within some of the Baptist churches saying gospel music than you saw in some of the Pentecostal churches. Hello. 
My name is Angela Tuck. I'm a third year PhD student at Emory University. And my question is, um, all day I've been sort of hearing about the transformations of Pentecostalism in the face of modernity. Talk, We've been talking about um, neo-Pentecostalism and its urban culture na- internationally. And, I, and also about the public face being Kojic branded and some of the, other, um, the more TV personality folks who carry this um, Pentecostal message internationally. I want to hear more about marginalized tr- traditions within African-American Pentecostalism, particularly the oneness groups and um, storefront churches and who, are, who don't necessarily have the public face behind them. What do you see as their role in, in this face of modernity? Uh, Dr. Franklin hinted at it a little bit, getting at that social justice issue, but w- what is their role um, in the 21st century? Um, one of the things I think your, your point is well taken, there are uh, uh, African-American denominations who are declining in numbers. Um, they, they, all African Pentecost, or black Pentecostal denominations are not growing. Um, some are declining because they are isolated from some of these trends that are developing and people don't feel connected. Um, some of the places that are growing, the life that's there, is because they changed. Um, the largest uh, black church within the city of Chicago is the Pentecostal Centers of the World Congregation. But in fairness to, to Apostolic Church of God, you wouldn't really know that they were Pentecostal um, if you went there because it's an upscale black church. Right. And, and it has that upscale black church. Matter of fact, there's more shouting at Trinity United Church of Christ right. than there is in the Apostolic Church of God. That's right. And you won't and you hear you can hear shouting music at Trinity United Church of Christ, but Bishop Brazier is not gonna allow it at Apostolic Church of God. If you're gonna shout, you're gonna shout without the music. Um so, 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 so there, 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 there's a variety of faces that's there, um, and, and there's a variety of expressions. Um, however, in some of the storefront churches, I think they play a role of a fictive family. And well, for, first of all, some of them are family. Um, that the, family. 30 people, the 30 people that go there are all related to each other. Um, and and, and that, that's not necessarily bad. I mean... Um, in villages and plantations, you have family communities gathering. And so they're, they're, they're transferring that into the city. Um, but those that aren't family are playing this role of a fictive family, I think. And they, they both help and support and create. And even some of those churches, I, I occasionally preach in some storefront churches, and some of them have praise music and praise songs and play tapes. So, so they're, not, they're not a throwback to the 1950s. They've also tried to change. They just don't have the mm-hmm. people. Um, and then, then lastly, I, I do think that there's also hidden within this that there, there like in, Chicago, in um, Boston, there's a, a church, the Green is the pastor, it's part of the United Pentecostal Church of Simmons of God, which is a predominantly uh, Afro-Caribbean American church that, that has been in the United States since the 1920s, mm-hmm. but, but its composition has remained majority people who are dis- either from the Caribbean or descendants from the Caribbean. So, so you also have that variety within uh, African-American Pentecostalism that it gets eclipsed um, by, by the face of a West Angeles or a Noel Jones or other kinds of churches. Um, I actually did think of one, and I think it's somewhat, it's probably going to sound cynical, and I guess maybe I don't mean it to, sound, to be as cynical as it sounds. I think one of the things that happens in the marginalized churches is that they export their best talent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that, um, that mm-hmm. when you look at the, um, you know, Take Jakes, for example, um, who's apostolic, right. who's, who's a oneness Pentecostal from West Virginia. Um, I mean, you could name, the list goes on and on. I think that, that individuals um, find their ways, find their nurture, and they grow up in the family life of the smaller congregation where you have to do, I started to say you get to do, but you have to do everything. <laughs> um, and then, you know, they move into other spaces, and they take those the insights and the gifts from the spaces where they began um, into other, other kinds of settings. So I think one, one influential thing, and it's not a small thing, um, is the export of talent into these larger spaces from these smaller spaces. Hi. I'm Antipas Harris. I'm a third year doctoral student at Boston University. And I'm very, I'm very grateful to be here today. Thank to all the panelists. Um, I was very attracted to the metaphor of playing jazz with the gospel. One, because I'm a musician. And, uh, but I think, I guess what I have to say is more of a comment and, po- and to pose 
uh, and issued, I think, that, that, that you're a sociologist, is that right? Uh, yes, that the sociologist raises. And that is uh, the notion of playing jazz with the gospel yearns for uh, a developed ecclesiology for the church today. Because if the notion of playing jazz with the gospel is accommodating the gospel to meet the need, I wonder if we are being responsible to the call of the church to speak to the need instead of just meet the need. Meaning that we have to stand, as uh, Marlon said earlier, in a, po in a post-critical time, seeing what does the church look like in a post-critical time that is not the same as the world, but is distinguished as the church. What is an African-American ecclesiology? I um I strongly feel that um just like the the black church arose out of a particular need the crisis of slavery that this alluded to um that this new black church I like to call it the new black church or the neo Pentecostal church is um sort of like you're saying you said not meet the needs but uh, speaking to the needs I think they're speaking to the needs the specific needs of how do black people make the transition in this postmodern, post-industrial, hyper-capitalist society? And so they, they're critiqued for not being you know, involved with social justice and things like that. I think their retort to that is um, you know, black folk now are more concerned about protected growth investments than hmm. civil rights you know, marches. And so and, you know, let's do empowerment seminars. Right? You know, let's get black people ready for this competitive, capitalistic environment rather than you know, spending time fighting the system. So their answer would be that speaking to the needs of, of postmodern hyper-capitalist society involves sort of their kind of a, approach with the gospel. And that's it's up for debate, but I think they would see that as speaking to the needs. So I think that's an excellent point you raised. It's a privilege to be here and to be a part of this great constituency. And um, all of you um, presenters make me proud to be black. <laughs> really, I mean that, I, I promise you. Um, I'm um, Pastor Aaron Lewis, and I'm a pastor um, in East Hartford, Connecticut, and also an author. Um, I have some real grave concerns, um, particularly connected. Uh, it's a, a, a thread in all of your um, um, lectures um, and presentations today concerning the future of the church. I heard the, the phrase neo-Pentecostalism that was um, kind of thrown out there, and it can't even be taken a step further and, and just um, in context of the church, the, the neo-church itself, because the church is evolving into something, um, I'm not sure what it is, uh, but I do know that it's trying, it has an effort to meet the needs of the community. Um, what, what are the challenges that we are going to face in your estimation in terms of the church becoming relevant to the needs of present day issues, the societal ills that are present now, what are going to be the challenges in making the shift? Um, one of the presenters um, talked about um, um, or referred to the obsolescence of some um, classical holiness churches that still exist, but they, they subsist to exist, so to speak, in light of a changing world. What are the, um, the major challenges that you all believe uh, we're going to have to face um, as we try to be culturally and spiritually and society relevant to an ever-changing society? I'm sure everybody has an answer to this question, and this one is my, this is a theological and not a historical one. I mean, I, I think we need power and we don't know it. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I, I'm not sure what it, I think we don't know it. I think we think we have what we need, and I think we don't actually. And I think the signs, the, the sort of widening gaps that in most churches you can see are, are a sign that we don't have what we need. And I think we need to figure out, I mean, I think um, Professor Lee's presentation I think is really important 
um, because I tend myself to be very critical of some of the people who seem to be able to close some of the gaps. Um, I don't like their content, but there, there's something about what, what energizes them that, that must be, that, that, that those of us who participate in regular churches, um, both Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal, um, but I think especially Pentecostal, I think we need to, we need to get to. And I, I, but I, I, think it, I think it is still related to um, an, older, the, an older sensibility, um, which I hope is not entirely nostalgia, um, that says that what you get with the Holy Ghost is power. Um, and, that, and that could mean, that means the power to, to run the folks who are gambling off your steps, on the one hand, the power to go to Harvard, in my case, on, on the other hand. I mean, that's the, that, pl- what the power does is different, I think, for, in different contexts, but I think that we need power, um, and we may not know it. I probably should say this, but I'm going to go ahead <laughs> and say it. Uh, people claim all the time that they really do want innovation. (laughs) But when religious migrants do bring innovative sorts of practices and even beyond just practices, thinking, people get real nervous real fast. Um, and I actually touched, I touched a little bit on this in my discussion, but I wasn't able to complete it because actually this piece that I'm working on is really not about Pentecostals per se. Most of my work right now is actually on those groups that are outside of traditional Christian categories. That's part of the reason I've spent so much time on Father Divine and all these other figures. And even uh, Mrs. W., the one woman that I quoted, said, you know, I'm not going to go all the way with possible the- theological results that might suggest that a human being, in this case, right, is divine, right? So I'm not sure. People claim to want innovation, but I'm not when it comes, whether it's oneness or a father divine, uh, I don't want that. You know? So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking out loud on this, um, but, um, you know, I'll be eager to hear, you know, in terms of reimagining, because we got some heretics coming next in the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, and I, I'm, I'm a heretic, you know. My my, my wife, uh, you know, my wife says, you know, I'm a heretic that loves Jesus. So that this allows me to stay, and the root for heresy is to choose, you know. Right. So you know, I'm just I'm just I'm going to be interested in hearing, you know, you're going to have some innovation yes. that's presented here. And I'm just going to be curious to see how people are going to respond to that kind of, not just liturgical innovation. We can kind of, you know, isn't that cute? That's nice. But, <laughs> you know, intellectual innovation, you know, is a different, is a different yes. sort of thing. Yes. I, I just want to say a couple things. One, one is we could all do the laundry list of issues, education and health care and et cetera, which a number of black Pentecostal churches are addressing, but there's a whole bunch that are not. And you're trying to find a way of getting more people interested and knowing about the options. One of the things I think that's missing is that a um, hundred years ago, there were a whole bunch of black religious newspapers that yes. partly because they couldn't afford to write articles uh, that would fill a newspaper, they did reprints. Reprints on the 1990s, dealing with uh, court cases, dealing uh, with um, the Spanish-American War. I mean, a host of other issues so, from a religious perspective. And, and that kind of discourse, conversation is absent now in the black church. Um, there, as, as there's been a call for a black, a black church-based think tank. 
Um, you know, we, we don't have that. Um, so, so, so we have to sort of piggyback on other conversations. Uh, second is that there's been a number of, 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 of prominent African-American uh, Pentecostals who become prominent because of TV. Um, their achievement is they built a big church and they're able to be on TV. Not because uh, they thought about it, they thought about issues. So, so, so when they, so, so, so when they get, so when they get access, it's basically a preacher who preaches well, who has access to the White House, but don't know what to say after they get there. Um, the, the next one is that in the Church of God in Christ in the 1950s, there was this because they were called overseers. There was this debate about switching from overseers to bishops, and they were fighting over it because the people who had the term bishop didn't want the other people to have the term bishop. And and in the middle of the fight, <laughs> Bishop Mason said, "Oh, just call them all bishops," and so everybody became bishop. Well, there, there, since the 1990s, well, here we are. there's been this craving for everybody <laughs> to be a bishop. <laughs> Storefront, 20 members, bishops. So, so, so there's this status struggle, and, and, and I don't want to minimize it, but something's behind that that we need to interrogate and scrutinize. And then lastly, you know, this is about globalization. Um, one of the things is, is that the, the U.S. black church, U.S. black Pentecostal church, has a hard time trying to figure out how to relate to the rest of the world. Not only politically, but, 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 but how many songs do you know, or do I know, from Nigeria, from Ghana? From South Africa. You know, how many of our choirs sing? Can, can, you, can we name five prominent African uh, pastors? You know, can, can, can we name five prominent African denominations? That's a problem. You know, we, we, we can't even do that because we're sealed off from all of that. And somehow the black church has to realize that not only do we have a role to play, but we have a lot to learn from the rest of the world. Okay. Thank you for your comments uh, this afternoon. My name is Pauline Jeanette, and I'm a third year MDiv student at BU School of Theology. And my question is directed to Professor Callahan and Professor Lee. I did a paper on passing in African American culture, Black of the Berry, the Sweet of the Juice, and it was really struck with the ramifications personally of what happens to an individual when they pass from the black culture to the white culture and what you have to give, a piece of your soul that you have to leave behind. And as you talk about playing jazz and moving into a neo-Pentecostalism, my question is, what is a piece of the Pentecostal church that's going to have to be left behind right. as they pass from one era to the next? Yes, yes. Mm. I can answer that, the second part of that. Um, I th some of the legalism, I think, is, is why, you know, uh, when the, the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship drew a lot of people because it emphasized the, like, the power of the Holy Spirit, but without some of the legalism, like you can't play cards, you can't go to the movies. So uh, I think that, that, in my personal opinion, that's one of the things, some of the, the legalistic practices, the, uh, the judgmental practices, and I, I think, you know, Full Gospel and the Zusa Fellowship were two movements that uh, tried deliberately to emphasize the power of the Holy Spirit, but without sort of the restraint of uh, the holiness background. I think one of the differences, I'm thinking on the spot, but one of, one of the differences, I think, is the way that there gets to be, um, because of the kind of changing nature of Christianity, um, the kind of I mean, denominationalism in general in Christianity is pretty much passe. There was a time you don't, if you moved to another city, you'd go and find the church of your denomination. Almost nobody does. People shop now in a way that I think is different than it was in, say, 1950. Um, what it means is that there's a kind of blurriness that you still don't get in the black-white, in, in the racial uh, divide, the sense that there really is a difference between black and white people is still pretty much, even now is still pretty, pretty solid and that you've got to be one or the other. I think the difference is in, in church culture is you, you don't have to be one. You don't have to be AME or Pentecostal. You don't actually, I mean, some people don't think you have to at least. And, and some people are living out and, and there are people who I'm sure would disagree, but, <laughs> but right. But there's, there's some, there's, there's the ability to, the, the boundaries are, the boundaries shift some more. The thing that I think is interesting, the thing I didn't talk about with Thoreau Harris in my presentation, is that Pentecostals experience that kind of boundary shifting denominationally 
um, especially in the first couple of decades, I think a lot as people got the new light, whatever it was. And it was, it was different things. Some of it was the development of the, the kinds of practices um, that Professor Lee is referring to as, as legalistic. I mean, you know, we, we, the Holy Ghost told us that you, didn't, you weren't supposed to wear a tie. And when I got saved, you know, suddenly my skirts got longer. I don't even know how it happened. <laughs> um, those, are, those are the kinds, those are the kinds of testimony. Let me say one thing that I think in some ways is a different perspective than the one that Professor Lee represents. One of the things I think that to me feels like a loss about all of that um, is that, that way that you move with conviction and that it changes your whole life. Um, there, this, your whole life changes aspect that's observable. One final thing. I can remember a time when I would go to the convention and I'd walk in the airport and I could pick out all the saints. <laughs> and while I found that oppressive in a certain kind of way, <laughs> I miss it. I, I, I li there was something about it that this is absolutely nostalgia. But there, I think, is a theological thing that underlies it that has to do with this sense that when the Holy Ghost comes, your whole life changes. That I think, um, I think we need to rethink. And it may be a part of the way we respond, even on the sort of economic social justice front, uh, to things like war. I know you want to talk about it, Paul, so I'm going to quit. <laughs> Hi, I need the microphone because this man has had his hand up for a long time, and um, and we're we, well. Yes, but we need it for our records. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations. As a fourth generation Assembly of God person who was raised quite patriotic, um, when I found pacifism in the early years of the first first generation Pentecostalism, it shocked me. And I went and did my dissertation on pacifism and the history of the Assemblies of God, and of course it's still in Kojic. And with the fierce gales of nationalistic pride that now are sweeping this nation, I have a question that I really need to know because I've changed dramatically of who I was ten years ago. I'm a very different person. Um, and here's my question. How can we draw from the wells of black Pentecostalism to encourage and defend a radical prophetic community that can withstand the fierce gales of nationalistic pride and witness to the conviction that the holy Christian ethnos is not only transracial and both genders and transcultural, but also transnational, thus echoing in both belief and practice the non-nationalistic theology of much of the early New Testament church and first-generation Pentecostals. Because we are multiracial, but we're also multinational. And the early Pentecostals said not only does racism pass away, nationalism passes away as well. And I don't want to see it happen to the black church to get sucked into nationalism. And I need some resources to draw on. Okay, who's answering? Who's answering? Who's answering on the panel? <laughs> if not, there are two. I'm supposed to end, but there were two more hands. One person had the microphone. Another hand is eager. But you're going to be on the next panel. You just, you, you, you just be cool, okay? <laughs> I love you, but you're going to be on the next panel. Okay. What's that? The Iron Chancellor? Yes. Is somebody going to answer his big question? Because this is, you know, how do we do this is a big question. And um, first of all, even in the Church of God in Christ, it ends up being complicated. Yeah. Um, so so you, you end up with a pacifist statement that's on the books, that re, that's still on the books today. And that um, some of us took that statement seriously. So during the Vietnam War, I decided that I could go. If I was drafted, I could go, but I have to be non-combatant status. Others decide they could have to conscious objective status. Others decide. And, and I think that um, I'm, I'm not sure how you, how you keep it. I think part of it is that if you, if you try to figure out why change, and I think that's one of the, the challenges, that then you, you have a resistance that's there. Um, I, I don't think that the Church of God in Christ is necessarily anti-nationalistic though um, a number of Kojic congregations do not have flags in the church, um, but partly because it's God's space, right. not necessarily because it's anti-nationalistic or, or being anti-patriotic, but, but, but it raises those kinds of issues. So I, I, I'm, not sure what a simple, I'm not sure what even a complex answer is, but, but, I, but I do think that um, it has to do with people both wrestling with Scripture yeah. and wrestling you know, with their own tradition. I, 
I actually wanted to respond in addition, actually. Uh, I, maybe I shouldn't do this. I don't yeah, have time. Um, I was talking to Randall Burkett about this issue about uh, race consciousness and the lack thereof or non racialism. Put the mic on. Non racialism and uh, you know, Father Divine and also in Pentecostal groups, uh, 1920s, 1930s. And we were struck by the, the way in which. Uh, when Father Divine came on the scene, they used the same um, infrastructure, uh, same printing presses, some of the same activists that were associated with Garvey, mm. right? Uh, which made me really start to rethink, what are we talking about when we, are, when we say non-racialism? Right? We're talking about it in a hyper-racialist right context. Right. So there's a racial dynamic even in the non-racialism, if that right. makes sense. Yes. Um, I'm not sure what this, whether this connects to your point directly, but it is something to, to think about, I think. Okay, and this needs to be the last question because we are over our time. Thanks. I'll make it quick. Uh, I'm Jeff Williams, a local pastor in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, given the fact that uh, the church was born out of slavery, uh, how does that experience negatively affect us today? I, I guess, number one, as a historian, I, I want to argue the, the, the black church was not born out of slavery. I want to argue that the black church precedes slavery. And I don't want this to go to Egypt, but I want to go to the Congo. And, you know, these numbers are all guesses. But, but one guess is that 10 percent of the um, Africans that were enslaved that came from the northern part of Africa, West you know, Senegal area, were Muslim. And 10 percent that came from the Congo were Christians. And there, there's even records of, of those in the, as, as late as the 1700s going to South Carolina saying that they were still Christian. And this is 1710, uh, 1720. And, and my, my thesis is, is that a number of them communicated Christianity to other people around. And the people, the, the people of South Carolina were Protestants, so they said that while they're Christians, they're really Catholics, so therefore we have to convert them. But they already came with a consciousness of being part of the Christian church. Now, how did slavery corrupt us? Um, I, I, I do think that there's multiple tensions and multiple impulses. So I think on one hand, some people radicalized. I think on other hands, some people accommodated. But I think that's always the case. I mean, I think we, every age we deal with those tensions. Um, lastly, I, I think slavery gave African Americans a chance to draw deeply in their own traditions. Um, and, and, and by their, both the poly, I mean, St Sterling Stuckey and others talking about the music, the dance, um, the perspective on the world. And so I think while slavery itself was corrosive and corruptive and evil, I think that African Americans were able to redeem all that to create this institution that I don't think is marred by it. Matter of fact, if, if um, Gutman is correct, it was when we moved into uh, the, the uh, capitalist society of the early 20th century that the, back, the, that the black family came under assault right. in new ways, and maybe even the black church came under assault. And I think that's one of the arguments of E. Franklin Frazier, that it was the urbanization, secularization that, that, that destroyed the church, not necessarily slavery in a comparable way. And I want to say thank you to everybody. And turn it over to our organizer, Dr. Frederick. What a very thought-provoking um, panel. What we want to do now is give you a, about a 10-minute break and start the next panel at 445. Marlon Milner has one comment or announcement about the bookstore. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you all from out of town are familiar with Divinity Hall. It's the smaller building uh, that houses the HDS bookstore, and there was a display set up of relevant titles both by our panelists that are available in the bookstore and other titles uh, relevant to African-American Pentecostalism, including uh, Bishop George McKinney's new book, The New Slave Masters. He'll be signing that book tonight after the worship service. So if you want that book, or other books such as Saints in Exile, Fire from Heaven, um, and other books that we have selected. Those are available in the HDS bookstore in Divinity Hall. The bookstore closes at 5 o'clock.